is Richard Wilson of Mad Shelley Films, and you're listening to Inspirado Projecto Radio. One of those things where you just keep going back to it. There's like a lot of nutrition hiding in there um, where you want to go back in and discuss it and, you know, see, see what other elements are in there. You want people to, to keep wrapping their brains around it. And, and then maybe the next time I see it, there's another little element that they, that they didn't see before. Like even Big Lebowski, every time I go back, I still see even more and more stuff. Right. There's so much unexplained stuff that's going on in there. And yet, it's like... It's great, and I think I, I'm noticing now. I think thanks thanks to David Lynch, big time. Like I'm so happy that Twin Peaks season three came back out because that made a huge amount of waves. I think with people who are now going, oh, okay, let's cool. That got a lot of good reviews. Now we can now we can weave in more of a of a dream into you know this um, you know weave in more of a sort of a surreal aspect into something that might seem. Because, uh, uh, you know, movies, like, there was this, um, there was this show that I had seen quite a few years ago, and it was called The Renegades of Filmmaking. Yeah. And they interviewed each of these guys, like Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino, and this one guy was talking about how, um, he, for his movie, I forgot what his name was, but he said, oh yeah, I had this great idea where... I wanted to, you know, do this really great shot. You follow along a ceiling, you go down the wall, and you go along this, and, zzz, and there's a guy sleeping in bed. Yeah. And he said, "Oh my casting, you know, my crew was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. That that's not going to work." And the guy goes, "Well, you know, my buddy Orson Welles, I had to talk with him, and, and I said, Orson, how do I get these guys to do this shot that I want?" And he goes, "Oh, easy, just tell them it's a dream sequence." Mm. And he goes, "Oh," <laughs> he went back to the set. He goes, "You guys, I forgot to tell you, this is a dream sequence." Nice. Now all of a sudden, all the ideas start sprouting. Out now there. Oh, I like that. Oh yeah, we could start on the fish eye, and oh, and then we'll do a close up of the pine cone, and you know, we'll do a close up of his fingernail. Oh, that'll be great. It's like now all of a sudden, but like that's what that's what filmmaking is. It's it's we, we shouldn't have to expect it to be like real life because we already know what real life real life is like anyway. So the, why are we going to the movie theater to escape, so to speak, to, to embark upon a whole brand new reality situation? Yeah, and I, I think we're. we're... We, for a long time, I think we were in a mode where audiences in general, I'm hope, hopefully we're coming out of this, but I don't know. Uh, there was a, I feel like people were in a mode where you'd go to a theater and you'd sit down and you'd almost have this like body language of arms crossed and you're like, okay, let's see how he messed this up. Oh, right. That was the default state Yeah. from the beginning of the film. Now, and... and the way I've always at, looked at it, from looking at films that push boundaries and push this, it's not like it's not asking the question, why did he do it that way? Right. It's asking, what is he trying to tell me by doing it this way? Oh, right. I mean, right. even if it's a mistake or not, like there's still a reason. Like none of this is arbitrary. I think audiences, and I've seen comments online where people try to devalue a piece of work or whatever by just being like they don't know what the hell they're doing right well they're they're more often than not even at the lowest levels and the most inexperienced levels there's always a justification for doing something some way yeah there's always a justification it might not work and it might not it's not necessarily right but there's still a reason yeah there's a reason why they left it in there even if it was a a happy accident um, there's a reason why they left that in there and it's it's intriguing because uh, I think it makes things a lot more exciting when you when you look at those and you go, oh, what's the, what is the possible reason why they left this little thing there? What is the possible reason why they left that in there? Um, and that's where the people like David Lynch come in. Like before you even sit down, you're already you're already, he's already conditioned you to be like, okay, I'm gonna see some stuff I don't understand, and I'm gonna have to figure it out if I really if I want to. Whereas you could go to another person's film and be like, well, why is he doing that? That's weird. But why does why does he get to have the license to be weird and the other person doesn't? Yes, have the license? that's a good. Yeah, that's such you a good know? point. Why do we afford let people do that? And I think part of it is because of your track record. You start off and you do stuff that's very 
straightforward and very one, two, three, four, five. When you try to backtrack or try to sidestep and do something that isn't, people are like, no, 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 no. You don't, you don't have that license. But I think everybody has that license. Anybody oh, yeah. You know, it's... I feel, too, that we're conditioned to believe that we, we, have, that we have to figure something out. You know, that we have to figure something out. And I think it's... Um, like, especially with David Lynch projects, if you just just be in that receptive mode rather than, rather than the analyzation mode, yeah. and you just be in that receptive mode and just appreciate that for whatever the heck that yeah. is, and just let that just kind of wash and go, oh, that's quite interesting. That was like a moving painting. Yeah. Now let's see what the next chapter is, <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, I don't know if it's just because of the sort of prevalence of you know, the online critic, you know, websites. There's so many websites where, and, and a lot of them are great, you know, where people want to discuss film and want to analyze it, but sometimes I feel like they come, they come from a different place. They come from a, yeah. let me tell, you know, like those videos that I hate, which is like 10 things that blah, blah, blah got wrong. And I'm like, well, it's not your movie. Yeah. Or even more narcissistic, which I think is the 10 things we want to see from this next movie that's coming out. It's like, that's not up to you. Right. You know, I, you just have to, I look at it almost like fantasy baseball. You get the team, the best team you can together, and then you put them working together. And if you can look at that group of people on paper and go, yes, I believe in those people's collective creative talent, then you should be willing to just go along with whatever they do. Yeah. You know, and not not that you have to blindly accept what happens. You can have your criticisms here and there, but like the idea that like you know, if, if you think you've got ten things that you think that person should do, like that's not your that's not your position. And you're automatically setting yourself up to go into that movie thinking, well, if they don't match what I've got in my head, then this movie is terrible. Right. Or I'm automatically going to be more negative on it because they didn't somehow fulfill the thing that I had in my head that they don't even know about. Right. And, and I don't get that. Don't and you think, like, okay, if they, if they spent half as much time critiquing movies as they did writing their own movie mm -hmm. and actually creating their own movie... Uh, <laughs> it's like, okay, how many of you guys who are these amazing critics actually wrote out a story, went out there to shoot it, and got the crew together? I think it should be a prerequisite for film critics to have to have made at least a short film. Yeah. On their own, starting from scratch, on every level, script phase, they have to have to write, and then a key, like gather a team to make a movie. Oh, yeah. Because I think that they would come from a very different perspective. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Than they, than they do now. You know, you always have the luxury of looking at something that's already created, mm -hmm. that took years and years of thought and creation. It's always the luxury to look at what's already created and go, here's how it should be instead. <laughs> it's like, what a wonderful luxury. You guys were not in the middle of it. You were not, you were not there on set. You had nothing to do with this creative process, and yet it's so easy to go, well... That oh, that's just a terrible. That should be more of a, a leaf green. That should that should be not be like a yellow green on there. I don't know what these guys were thinking when we made this uh, this stained glass window. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I've never made a stained glass window, so I don't know. I don't know what the heck you know. I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. Maybe leaf green is a hard color to get in glass. <laughs> Maybe there's a reason. And, and oftentimes that's things. There's so many things that are criticisms where you're like, there's a perfectly good reason for that being exactly the way that is. It's not necessarily a mistake. But it's so much easier to label it as a mistake than to do the work of trying to figure out what were they trying to say? Did they succeed in saying that thing? And then to what degree did they succeed in saying that thing? And then make the determination whether it was a mistake or not. And what's crazy too is when, when, when you hear those arguments of like, when they put one movie up against another movie that has, like, like this movie is its own movie. Like, why, why is that movie being compared to this movie? Like, oh, well, it's no Star Wars, but, you know, I like the movie. Well, no one's asking you to say it was a Star Wars or it wasn't a Star Wars. Like, what did you think of this movie just for what that thing was? Um, and in addition to that, what movies have you created? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's such a hard... 
it's just a hard thing you know, to like get that many people together and create something and put something down yeah, yeah. You know, and not, not that that just because you made a movie you should be given carte blanche to do whatever you want you know, but there are like amazing filmmakers that have made mistakes but the mistakes they make are you know they're not technical mistakes or like flaws or they're they're just they might have actually just been them trying to do something new you know and the thing that I've always said that I love is I would much rather see somebody try something new and fail than to do the same old thing and succeed oh yeah oh yeah to me it's you know any movie that you know goes in a different direction or does something different <laughs> if it was something I've never seen before or never quite seen in that arrangement before I'm going to give it way more credit and way more like benefit of the doubt than just like oh they're just taking the typical this is the way this sequence is supposed to go and we've seen this a thousand times before you know so it sounds like a like like a you know like a reinterpretation of another song you know what I mean Mm -hmm. it already exists Mm -hmm. and those are fine you know cover songs are cool but but if you know if, 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 I don't know maybe, maybe that is what it is maybe the equation is is like the idea that some people want to hear cover songs so they want this movie to just be a cover of that movie and when they don't get that they're mad I don't know maybe that's what it is I think it's fun when like once I realized the power in cre- I, I'd always hear the phrase and then once once you start applying the phrase you're like oh this is why this phrase is so important or why this cliche is so important or whatever um, creating the art that you want to see in the world I think that's such a powerful 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 phrase create the art that you want to see in the world because now it's coming from a place of authenticity and it's coming from a, a, a place of trueness and it's something that is you know, when you create the art that you want to see in the world, you're, you're, you're committed to that vision. You're committed to it all the way through. And it's unapologetic. And it's just, zip, here it goes. Okay, critics, go ahead. Shoot your arrows at me all you want. I made the movie I wanted to make. Yeah, and that's... See, I like, I like ones that... I think there's a difference between critic and film criticism. <laughs> right? Like, the, I love reading the ones where people want to delve into it oh. and want to get into the detail and get in the weeds with it. Mm-hmm. As opposed to just, like... Because I feel like so much of critic stuff that you read nowadays, it's like... They're just trying to... They're trying to go for that sound bite. They're trying to find yeah. that cool, Twitter-friendly... Yeah, yeah. You know... Right. Minimal character soundbite right. that will be easy to place on a lot of things, but that's not criticism. You know? Yeah. Like there was a great uh, website that we submitted our film to uh, called Neon One Dot. This guy Ryan who runs it. It's mm. super cool. I mean, he's just starting out. It's really small, and he reviewed our movie. And the cool thing about it was that when I read it, I mean, just the simple thing of he gave his review a title that had to do with his take on the movie and that to me already was like that's amazing because that takes time and thought and a certain amount of your own creativity oh yeah and he wrote about the movie and he wrote like very like he really was inter- interested in getting into the weeds with it wow and I and, and that's the thing that's amazing for a filmmaker to read because we you know, just hearing the like, I, I liked it, I didn't like it, you know, it worked, it didn't work, like, that doesn't always help us. Like, right. But when you, when you get into it and you just go, here's my take on what I think I saw, you know, and, and here's what I understood of it, here's what I, th- and, 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 and even more importantly, here's what I think the filmmaker was trying to say. Mm. Like every, every film review should have something like that. Mm. It should have, like, here's what I think they were trying to say. And a lot of them do. But, but when you're just trying to go for that sound bite, it doesn't allow for room for that. I've, I've, written, I've, I've read a lot of like really cool um, articles about, for instance, uh, the season three of Twin Peaks, and it's so fun to see how people try to make sense of things rather than 
you know, it's like the, it, it's enjoyable for me, to, like you're saying, to, to see the connections between things rather than simply breaking things apart. You know, going, oh, here, here's why that's crappy and here's why that's wrong and why that doesn't work. It's fun to go, ooh, here's a possibility as to why this might have happened, or ooh, I got a theory. Maybe this is what was going on while that was happening. And ooh, you know, and then you start going, oh yeah, and you start connecting dots together, and you go, ooh, now that matches up with this, and that matches up with this. Um, forever is just, it's such a mind bender because I feel like. As soon as I come up with one theory, then it's it's like it's squashed by another theory <laughs> that I come with right around the corner, um, and I'm like, because I'm I, there's there's the there's the, the the friend and like I'm wondering, did he you know, is he responsible for this crazy stuff the woman is going through, or? It, does that just happen to be a supplementary thing t to a paranormal experience that's going on there? Or is this something that's going on in her brain? Or is, you know, it's like, there are so many interesting, and, and yet they can all totally work together at the same time even, which is quite interesting. Uh, two checks, please. Can I have a, another coffee, please? Thank you. We, are, we, we did go in with the idea, there was always those three possibilities. It's real, it's supernatural, it's in our head. There was always those three. <clears throat> and we always, we, we got very deep into the production where we wanted all three of those things to be possible. And then slowly along the way, like, we made up our minds as to what's going on, uh -huh. but we still wanted the film to have plausibility in all three. Because it's not my job necessarily to, to nail it down and go, yes, this is what it is. It's much more fun, especially when it's a short film. It's much more fun to just be like, what do you think it is? And you tell me why. Argue yeah. with me. You know, and maybe I screwed something up, and maybe I tipped my, in, without knowing it, I tipped my hand, and it actually is one of those things specifically based on what I've put out in the world. Uh, so you tell me why you think it's that, and maybe you're right. You know, it seems like one of those classic examples of don't shoot the messenger kind of thing. Like, you're just delivering a message. You're just kind of like the, the herald of, of information that just comes in and goes, okay, here's, here's this stuff that I was inspired by, and, you know, I, I'm not obligated to explain any of it to any of you. <laughs> you're just going, here's, here's what it is. Yeah, yeah and that, that, there's that school of thought where, like, the, there are people that say, like, filmmaker, filmmakers have to know everything about the movie and have to know for sure, you know, each specific detail. And I agree to that to a certain extent. I think they have to know everything in order to execute the vision that they have. But because the film then gets released and gets put out there and it's just, it becomes someone else's. Because the moment you start to interpret it for yourself, it's partly yours now. And the filmmaker doesn't have control over who decides what it is. You know, it was great. Like, and, and sometimes, like, I like to leave a little history for myself. Because that's fun for me. Obviously, I'm not going to leave, like, a massive hole in the plot just because I want to leave mystery. Yeah. But you can allow yourself a little bit of those indulgences. Like, case in point, uh, Raymond Chandler. Raymond Chandler. Whenever I get a phone call, it stops the thing, so then I just have to start a new one. All right, here we go. All right, so yes. I'll just back it up. I was going to say, case in point, uh, The Big Sleep, I think Raymond Chandler uh, wrote about this, and there was, I forget who he was talking to or corresponding with. I think it was actually John Huston who directed it. I think John Huston directed it. Whoever directed Big Sleep. Uh, they were working the script or adapting it, and there's a part, part where I'm thinking, there's a Thank part you. where he writes to Raymond Chandler and he's like, and he says, you know, I have, I have a couple of questions about the story. And, and he goes, well, who killed the chauffeur? And Raymond Chandler wrote back going, I don't know. And he really didn't. 
because it was this one character that was sort of a loose end and he's, he's killed and there's a possibility for several of the characters to have had motive and opportunity to do it but he never really just divulged it because A it was not integral to the story and B maybe he liked just leaving a little bit of that open to himself yeah. he can have an idea of who he thinks it was someone else can have a completely different idea and be just as valid about who he thinks it was you that's know? so cool. Yeah. I mean, so, and nowadays, we're, I think that's becoming more accepted. You know, like, in very degrees, like an Inception. You know, at the end of Inception, mm -hmm. does the top fall or doesn't it? You know, like that's probably one of the greatest examples of, uh, of like, an open-ended thing. Like, it doesn't matter whether it fell or not. I mean, you've just seen the whole story, a beginning and a middle and an end, hopefully a satisfying one. So whether it fell or didn't is not important. In fact, being able to keep those two possibilities in your head makes you have to envision a different movie or a different outcome. Oh, yeah. And that's more of what he wanted to get across. It's, it's making you have to like figure it out for yourself. Yeah, because you know? now you got to look at the movie through that other lens. You get to re-experience the movie through now that lens. Um, there was this great quote that uh, Lynch was talking about. He goes, you know, I like to make movies where there's about a 35% mystery left over at the end. <laughs> he goes, you know, just like the movie, uh, his example was in um, Chinatown. And uh, at the end, the one guy says to Jack Nicholson, he goes, he's like, forget about it, Jake. That's just Chinatown. Yeah. Well, and that's the answer, right? That's supposed to be the answer. Oh, forget about it. That's just Chinatown. Like, okay, okay, I can live with that answer. But then you go, but, okay, thank you for that answer. But what about all of these other things that are going on? You know, it's like, yeah, you're given the answer. Like you say, with exception, you're, you're kind of given, here you go. And then, and here's this other little extra thing. And, then, and it makes you just kind of look back through it all. And but with Chinatown, it still presented you with a fully realized story. Yeah. Like, you might be missing that detail, but you still saw the like beginning of a relationship between Jack Nicholson and Faye Dunaway's character, the evolution of it, and the conclusion of it. Mm -hmm. And beyond that is where the mystery came in. So you weren't, you weren't robbed of anything. Right. You would get actually given something else to think about. You know, it's, it's not a it's not a missing detail. It's it's a, it's a kernel for more. Yeah. That's fun to be able to leave that little that little tiny like right before the door shuts. You're like, oh, and this. Okay, see you later. <laughs> I think he even put a, a more of a thing on it because he he named the movie Chinatown. So then it yeah. makes you wonder. It's like, wait, what is it about Chinatown that that allowed him to answer that way? Oh, yeah. And then why name the movie? That? Yeah, yeah. Because the movie wasn't about something that happened in, or this thing that happened in Chinatown. It was about the water and the you know the, the shady dealings about bringing water to L.A. and all that stuff. What does that have to do with Chinatown? Wow, yeah. that's incredible. Do you have ideas cooking up right now for uh, for new stuff? I absolutely do. Well, I, I mean, I'm trying to... The one thing that doing the festivals has kind of done is, like, it just makes me want to be at more festivals. Mm. And you realize that the film you have has a shelf life, festival-wise. And so, uh, it, it, in even just talking to other filmmakers, like, everyone's constantly just putting out and getting into the next thing. And so, I've been in a mode in the past where it's taken me a long time to kind of get into the next thing for whatever reason or another, just not having the right thing not being afraid to jump into something, not too sure. So I want to try to get past that and just see if I can actually, like, like you were saying earlier, build up build up a momentum and just ride it. Do you, how often do you, because I imagine you probably have a lot of idea books with lots of built up, you know, inventory of information. Do you find yourself diving into there ever to, to go, oh, yeah, 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 that's a, that's a good little nugget. I'm going to plug that into this thing. I'm not, I'm not that good with random snippets. I feel like I, I, feel like I do a uh, Darwin's theory of evolution when it comes to, to snippets of ideas. I'll keep, like, anywhere from five to ten in my head, and the ones that aren't that good will just, I'll forget about them. The ones that I keep remembering over and over again will, will get bigger and bigger and bigger, and I'll add more onto it here and there, and then eventually it'll get so big that I'm like, 
I got to write this down or I'm going to forget a lot of this. And so that's so that's when I know that it's a decent enough idea. Is that it's grown like a fungus inside my head. It's gotten big enough that like I now it now deserves to be put on paper. So. Do you try to write stuff uh, around what um, is already available in your resources, or um, do you? just not worry about any of that and just, just write this story that you just want to write? Um, I think I, I, probably a little bit of both. I think there's some ideas I've put down uh, that are bigger and would require a lot more financing and things like that. But the ones that I feel like I try to develop more are ones that in my head I'm like, well, I could probably do this. So naturally in my head goes back to that. It keeps developing it for me because it know, we know that there's a, an outlet, there's a possibility. So Fear, um, what was the movie where you built that awesome box? It looked so... It was so unique. That was the, the first feature, or first short film that I did called The Procedure. And, yeah, it was a very, like, again, that was one that sort of, like, the idea stuck with me for a long time. I've been doing animation work for a long time. For years and years, I got into this, like, sort of sidetrack of animation. Awesome. And then I just, it was great, but I knew at heart I wasn't an animator. You know, like, it's, there's people that do it way better than me. They're... There are animators that I work with, and I'm like, you have this drive to do this animation and be better at it and get better at it. And I just, I always just did it because a, the work was there. I knew how to do it. And it, and at a certain point, I was like, I, I do want to go back to live action. And so the, so I'm like, well, what's that going to be? So the, from there ensued a couple of years of thinking about ideas and abandoning ideas because they weren't good enough or this and that and then finally like nailing one that was like it was almost more it wasn't that it excited me beyond all reasonable doubt it was more just like this is good enough I've thought about things for too long it's time to just do it so this one I think is good enough and then let's find out so I kept I, I developed it and wrote it out and as I developed it and wrote it out it got better and better and better to a point where I was excited about Shoot it. And I don't know if that's the right way to do it, but it was the way that one worked. Did you build it yourself? Uh, no, I got a buddy of mine named Roy Wood who had done a lot of like stop motion stuff in the past, and he was yeah. actually he worked for Disney, Disney's Imagineering company. Oh, like cool! Helping design and set up like like rides and things wow. like that. And so I talked to him because I wrote this script, and I was like need this box and I have no idea how to do it and I just you know he and I were friends and I was like can, can you do it like how much would this cost and he was like well we'll go to Home Depot and figure it out and so it was a combination of like a bunch of like raw material that we got at Home Depot and some little pieces that we got off of eBay here and there I think all told the box probably cost somewhere in the neighborhood of like it was under a thousand dollars it was somewhere between 800 and Whoa. I mean, it was huge. It weighed 175 pounds. Was, Did it have wheels on it? No, we'd have to literally lift it up and put it on oh. one of those like furniture dollies. Whoa! You know, man. that's how we got it around. Whoa, <laughs> man! No wonder you didn't want to move it around when you moved to to new places. Because holy moly, that's crazy. Yeah, because we it had to be sturdy enough that we could put someone inside it. And that they can yeah. do a fair bit of action without having to worry about knocking it knocking it apart or breaking it open. And then we started. He had actually, Roy, my buddy, had the idea of like building it so that the walls could open. So all all three walls, oh, so you could shoot. all four walls actually opened. We, we, they had like little locks that we could open and close it with. So when we did. We shot with all. At one point, I think we shot through all four walls. Wow! Yeah. Incredible. What a brilliant idea, too. Yeah, it was a good idea because we needed it. For sure. That's the thing. Like that's what I've noticed is that you know the. When you don't have funding, the creativity actually grows, grow, it has a lot of room to grow when you have just, like for instance, oh my gosh, what could take place in a box, you know? Mm -hmm. Or what can just take place in this one room, or what could just take place, oh, yeah. whatever. I got this trampoline, okay, let's write a movie around the trampoline. Yeah. Uh, and then before you know it, you're like, whoa, this idea never would have existed if I, if I had the huge budget to, to do this, all this other crazy stuff. Yeah. Do you... Um, with locations, do you um, do you try to find 
do you try to do a guerrilla style, or do to, or do you, um, go to places that you gotta get permits and whatnot, or? For, for, for forever, it was all it was just the luck of having found. We did we did ask around. We asked mostly just around friends, and we got lucky enough that we found that apartment that was perfect in every way. And so that one was like we didn't have to look for location managing or like find locations that we didn't know people at and, and then get it. We just found the perfect thing and it was lucky. Uh, for the procedure before that, I actually went. We went searching for locations. We put out like ads on Craigslist back in the day because that was still big. Um, we shot it. So we were looking for like we needed the place to look like a fairly well-to-do house mm. and I put out a thing and this guy uh, responded and it turns out he was a documentary filmmaker himself so mm. he understood what it meant to like need, need a location you know? and he said hey you can come check a look at my house it's in, it was in Bel Air and I went down there and I went in his house and I remember the moment we walked in He's like, oh, I need you to take your shoes off because this wood is like cherry wood from Japan or something like that. Oh, and I'm just like, there's no way I can shoot in this house. And I told him that. I was like, this is a lovely house. I would be terrified shooting here because we're going to have a crew. We have a 175-pound box. And I don't want to mess your floor up, man. And so he said, yeah, no, you're probably right. Uh, and he goes, well, maybe do uh, you want to check out um, our pool house? He said, we had a separate like pool house. And it, it was up, like, uh, up the hill from the house itself. We had to go up uh, stairs. And then there was, like, this pool up there. And next to it was this, like, like much bigger... I'm thinking, like, it's a shed. And I was like, no, but I'll take a look. I appreciate you being so nice. Yeah, yeah. We get up there. It was, like, a five-room pool house with, like, all one... And it was shaped like a... It was on the corner of the pool, so it in and of itself was, like, an L shape. Wow. And all of the side that faced the pool was glass. And it was awesome. And he, we walk in, and it was concrete floors. And he goes, "Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna resurface and repaint all this stuff. So if you guys mess it up, we don't really care." And I'm like, "This is the location you should have showed me." Whoa, man! <laughs> and so we did. We shot at that pool house, which, looking at the film, like you'd never know that that was just like somebody's pool guest house. What the heck? Yeah. Yeah, when you think of a pool house, you think of like what, like a little pool cabana, like oh here's a little room, oh yeah, you get to, there's a bathroom, you know. <laughs> but this was like an actual house. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, it could have been a normal house for most other people. Man, I'm sure they're they're Airbnb that thing out right now. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I keep looking for, like, just free locations, like just yeah. just stuff that looks magnificent. Like I. Like, I'd love to find, if you know of any waterfalls, I, I would love to just shoot shoot near a waterfall. It's a canyon? You ever Eaton canyon? canyon in Pasadena? No. Yeah, it's a trail. It'll take you like 40 minutes to get to it, but there's a waterfall there. It's, there's a lot of people that go up there, so you mm. might, if you want to be all by yourself, you might have to go like really early in the morning. But yeah, Eaton Canyon has a waterfall. Um, I would look around do Google search in like the Angeles Forest because there's a lot up there that might have that I think in this day and age it seems like it'd be easier to shoot guerrilla style because I mean especially if you just shoot with a cell phone or something because mm -hmm. you can always be like oh yeah I'm just a tourist I'm just you know right. we're just out here if you don't have some big like camera on your shoulder or something it's not going to draw any attention to you yeah yeah I mean I know a lot of people who just get I mean, in some way or another a certain percentage of the projects that they've done were just some of it was the location that they just took on their own and did what kind of camera did you shoot with for forever it was a 5D Canon 5D so we shot with that but the DP Chris who uh, was awesome um, brought like either brought his own or he he loves lenses and so he brought a full package of like cinema lenses that were probably you know there were hundreds of thousands of dollars and he just and so we slapped these like super expensive lenses on this like three thousand dollar camera <laughs> yeah I mean but it, yeah that's the thing it makes it changes the whole look of the movie which is great that's what I hear it's the lenses that make I mean geez I mean if we were just to look at any footage that's taken out of even a cell phone camera from 10 years ago 
it's still crispier than whatever they shot in the 1920s, you know? And, and those movies still hold up and people are still watching them, you know? So it's like, it's just amazing just to see what can be done with what we got these days. Yeah, there's a lot. And there's, there was a great story. I don't remember where it was from, a documentary or something where, like, Francis Ford Coppola brought somebody into, he's at Zoetrope in San Francisco, and he says, he's like, come take a look at this room. And he brings them into this room, and inside the room was all these, uh, was a camera and a bunch of, like, film short ends that he'd accumulated from, like, at the end of this movie, there were this many X amount of reels of film we never used, and this many, and he had hundreds of them. And he's just like, this is power. Like, this is the ability to shoot something without having to ask permission. This is power. And I feel like it's even easier now. Yeah. It's not film. It's not. If you have a camera and, and a hard drive, and yeah, lens to go with it, that's it. Especially with the editing programs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You could color correct stuff like crazy and yeah. add all kinds of cool stuff to it. And Adobe After Effects, suddenly there's a, there's a fire on the table, you know? <laughs> it's incredible. Do, what, what kind of realms, like what kind of genres um, do you find yourself most drawn, uh, drawn to? Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll do anything. You know, like, and yeah, I've written totally everything. Yeah, I did, for a while, I did, I think I've settled into this genre, the genre genre. I guess the genre is now its own genre, right? Because it covers, like, horror, thriller, sci-fi. Oh, that's stuff. true, yeah. But, uh, you know, like, I've written comedy, I've written uh, the horror stuff, and I've done, even recently, written more sci-fi, you know, and it's... Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm not really, it's whatever story I think interests me. Do you ever want to do a musical? That's one I've never done, and I don't know that I would. I'm very tricky with musicals. I am not, I don't have the patience for some of them. And I, and I know that they're very good, and they're works of art in their own way. But for me, like, <clears throat> and I know that there's plenty of people who argue against this, but for me, it's like, I feel like you're telling a story and then you interrupt the story to do a song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which sometimes all it does is reiterate the point you just made. Yeah. And, and now I have three minutes of this. And yeah, there's spectacle involved and choreography and all this kind of stuff. But at the same point, we're just repeating a point that we just made. Yeah. And where I feel like I'm, I've, I've gotten very into the idea of economy of, you know, time and economy of information. And it's like, do we, you know, with... Uh, Aladdin do we need three and a half minutes to tell right. people it's a whole new world mm -hmm. right. we don't right. <laughs> right. but yeah right. it's a good song it's catchy it's cool there are people that love it and I would never deny anyone that just me personally what about a western have you ever written a western uh, I've never written a western I've written a western I, if I had the right idea for it I would I just talked about this with somebody else where the only ones that I ever really loved growing up uh, were the were the, the like the Sergio Leone films, the sort of John Wayne westerns and the the one stagecoach and all that stuff. And again, they're milestones in cinema history and all that stuff. But they 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 never resonated for me. Mm. And I think part of the problem was that there was just a there was just such a reverence for that time and you know the landscape. And I never really appreciated Westerns until I saw, like, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, which basically t said, fuck the reference. Like, sorry, it's been nice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They were like, screw that reference. Like, and the movie tells you that in the first three seconds. Like, it opens up on this landscape, which is what you expect from every Western. And it's beautiful, and it's awesome. And then all of a sudden, this dirty cowboy's face wipes in and he's got this like nasty cigar sticking out of his mouth and he's sweaty and he looks like an asshole and you're just like this movie does not care yeah. about the legacy of cowboys or the reverence of God's country or whatever it is it is here to undermine all of that and that's where I liked it I saw uh, El Topo for the oh, first yeah. time and I love that take on a western because it is it's like, 
it's weird. It's weird because it's in parts it feels like a horror film in certain certain mm -hmm. aspects, and then certain aspects it feels science fiction, and then it's uh, I talk about unapologetic creating like it's it's really neat to see something like that was just created back then and in and knowing that that was in probably in theaters I'm thinking right I can't remember but wasn't that one of those movies that was like really hard for people to find and they would have these bootleg VHS's running around everywhere I remember that being the case when I was like in film school and people everyone knew about El Topo but no one had seen it or people lied about seeing it or something, but it was so hard to find that. And then, of course, the, the legend of it was bigger than the reality, you know? Uh, I didn't actually see it until probably like a few years ago where I bought the Jodorowsky box set. Oh, cool. You know? Probably like 10 years ago, but uh, yeah, no, it was a trip. It was definitely not what I was expecting. Um, and in some ways, I thought the myth of it was bigger than the actual movie, you know. But but as a piece of filmmaking, it was awesome. Yeah. I just recently saw the uh, the documentary of Hodorowski's uh, Dune. Mm -hmm. Whoa! I oh, I would love to believe in a parallel. Well, it totally is happening. The parallel universe. That movie is made. Yeah. I mean, just the idea that he was gonna. And then it influenced all these other sci-fi movies, you know, like the Blade Runner or Alien would never have been what they were if not for the fact that artists who did, who like, who were trained up on the, the pre-production for Dune then went on to work on these things and sort of carried pieces of that with them. Like, there was the one in the, in the documentary that was awesome was he was saying that there were these like, book books that he'd created. With Mobius, I think. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it like outlined the entire movie. And he said there were only like four or five of them ever made or something like that. I would love to see that. Because I think he showed one of them in the, in the documentary, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like They're showing like the storyboards. And it's cool, too, because they would show the movies that were influenced by that movie that was never made. Yeah. And, and they're putting up the storyboards and the drawings by Mobius next to these movies that really definitely took took those aspects. Man, it's uh, just incredible. Like, he was going to stick Salvador Dali in there as, like, this emperor, and uh, Mick Jagger is one of the guys. And I love how he goes, you know, I found my first warrior. I, need to find, I needed to find my other warriors. Mobius was my first warrior, you know, and, and it was just great because it's like, what a great way to describe that. You, you, you need someone who's a warrior, who's willing to, like, just, okay, we're going to just give to this vision. We're just going to, what can we do to, to keep this thing moving? How do we, how do we contribute to this? And, uh, yeah, just seeing some of the, uh, some of those storyboards, like, animated in, in little bits, and you're going, whoa, that's so kick-ass. There's that one scene where there's this ship, and all the spice is, like, there's a big hole that's torn out of it, and all the spice is just, like, dribbling out into, this, into space while it's flying. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, that guy. You'd have to think that there'd be a time at some point where someone finally just decides to make it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think somebody's working on it right now. Is it Denis Villeneuve or something like that is working on it now? The guy did the new Blade Runner? Mm. He might be working. I think he's working on it now. And you'd hope that... Oh, as like a series, basically. Is it? Right? I think he's stretching okay. it out. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you'd hope that he was at least, he would at least go back to that well. You know? Yeah. I don't know. But... Yeah, and whoever is living, whoever is still living... Like, God, you know, that's something where, like... I frequently, frequently think about my future billionaire self who is just helping fund these projects that, you know, with his, with the people who have influenced me. Um, every once in a while, like, for instance, have you ever seen the TV show The Prisoner? The original? Or the yeah, the original. HBO? The original one. No. I mean, Ooh, pieces here. It's so there. good. You could definitely see how all these other shows were influenced by because it's very surreal and really cool and so I'll look through that and I'll go ooh is the guy who did this soundtrack is he still alive or is the producer still alive or, you know and, I, and I'm like talking about you were talking about dream teams earlier like I think ooh I would love to get this guy involved in a movie you know my, where I'm going okay my future billionaire self he's, he's funding a movie that has this producer from this TV show this guy who worked on this this you know and just like yeah. putting it all together and I would love to believe that there is someone out there who'd be willing to, to make Hodorowski's version of Dune come come to pass. Where, okay, whoever's still alive, whoever's still living, that he originally wanted to work with, or, or you know, like, bring that team back together, yeah. 
and, and put it out there in the world. Because the guy was so passionate. He was so passionate about getting that out there. Yeah. He had it so alive, distinctly... He? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You think they would give it to him to do? Boy, that'd be so nice. Yeah. That'd be so nice. Because he had everything so well thought out. You know, you're looking at his books, his big, thick books of all this information. Looks sort of like the... Was it Stanley Kubrick's Lost Project? The Napoleon film? No, I never heard about that. that. Mm -hmm. There's a whole book that's devoted to it. Like, he was preparing... Before he died, he was preparing... Like a, I guess he'd been preparing it for decades with his whole Napoleon movie. And he, he had, like, thousands of photographic references. And he, there's a script, and... He had like a whole, I don't know about full storyboards, but there definitely is some. And there's the, that book company, Toshin, mm, mm, who does like mm -hmm. all those fancy books. They, they did a, a version of, uh, called Stanley Kubrick's Napoleon. It was a collection of like a lot of that stuff. Whoa. Isn't that crazy when someone has put all that work in, a, in envisioning it? You figure, okay, someone's got to come along and help put that out there in the world. Yeah, and I, just, I mean, that's, that's the crazy thing. It was like, Makes you almost feel daunted, where it's like if Stanley Kubrick can't get a movie made, <laughs> you know, uh, it's just like, have you seen the, tra the documentary for, um, or even the film, the Orson Welles' Other Side of the Wind? No, I got, I got, I've, I've, I've seen the trailer. Did you see it? Yeah. Is it cool? Here, or what? Here's how you need to. God, watch. it looks so let fun. Let me give you an, Let me give you steps on how to watch it. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, because this is what I honestly feel. This is how you need to watch the movie. You watch the other side of the wind first, okay? It's going to feel like a haphazard mess. And then you watch the documentary about the other side of the wind, because they're Netflix, did two, they did the oh. movie, they, rec they got a team to like finish the film. Then they all, there's also a documentary about how it became. Wow. So watch the movie first, and then you watch the documentary. And then you go back and watch the movie again. And it is a completely different movie, knowing all of the backstories and the construction of it. it. And just where Orson Welles was, um, you know, psychologically, geographically, like all that kind of stuff. It's kind of Whoa! Amazing. I'm sure just tons of nuggets of information come <clears throat> yeah. coming through, because you're like, aha, I see where that came from. Right. Ooh, I know what that's all about. And, with and it. all of a sudden, the movie, I wouldn't say it entirely... It does, actually. It, it makes much more sense. And I think just from the... From watching it again, you get it, you get you pick up on more stuff than you would have seen the first time. But having the context, I think that's the thing. The movie is so reliant upon context, even more so because it's not slight spoiler, but it's very autobiographical. Mm. Of course, and Wells, and it's ve not even like autobiographical about his past. It's almost like real time autobiographical. Like it, literally, he's putting things into that movie that were happening to him at that moment. Incredible and rewriting things because what X or Y had happened and so he's like putting that in the movie and so once you know those things about him the movie itself makes more sense oh man yeah I'm so happy that I'm so happy that someone decided to go in there and put that thing out yeah. there in the world I mean because it seems like it's like you always hear about the Jerry Lewis, so some Jerry Lewis movie that was never like totally released or something oh it was a clown it was a clown in the holocaust it was a clown during the Holocaust or something. He plays a clown. And um, th that movie was just never released. Hmm. And it's like... It's, it's neat, that idea that someone actually honored Orson Welles's, you know, that footage, put, it, put whatever else they had to do to get it, get it together and, and get it out there into the world. Who knows how many movies are like that that are just sitting on shelves that have never been seen. documentary, again, slight spoiler, but there's like three or four other movies of Orson Welles that are still in various stages of disarray. And they show clips of some of them, and I'm like, I don't really want to see that. And they even said that some of them don't have any audio, so they don't even necessarily know what people are saying because they don't know, also they don't have the original script or that the original script was deviated from. Uh, I was like, just put those out there. That's a historical record that should at least be, you know, out there for people mm. to learn from, mm -hmm. if, not, if not anything else, just to learn from. Man. Yeah. I thought F is for uh, fake was just terrific. Yeah. I saw that a few years ago, and Still I thought, that, that is fun. There's, it's a, there's a clip. Actually, do you mind pausing real quick? Oh, yeah, yeah. Go off the record, but I have There's There's a clip. So, um, 
Are there any particular directors or cinematographers that you'd like to one day work with? Cinematographers? Uh, I actually love to work with Chris again. He's the guy who did the cinematography on forever. He is like, and he's become so much even bigger since then because he's constantly working and he's always, always like getting better and bigger and all this kind of stuff. So I honestly just hope I get to work with him again because I'd love to. Uh, you know, directors, like... I know you like to, I know you like to direct, but maybe, you know, like co-directing with... Well, I, I'm doing a lot of work for, right now, this director named Mark Pellington. He did, like, Mothman Prophecy. Oh! And, like, uh, since then, he's done a lot of other movies. Um, I Melt With You, and most recently, this movie called Nostalgia. And he's... I did some work for him on some side projects and, like, some uh, uh, short work that he was doing. And he's awesome, because he's, like so experienced and like the guy has done everything and so anytime I get to work with him and like learn from that is great so yeah um did you see the movie Coherence? I don't think so I just saw it last night it was it came out like 2013 I, it's okay. one of those movies that I am so surprised that it has not it, it all, pretty much all kind of takes place in one house, one location, mm-hmm. but whoa, it's a... It takes place during a party? Yes. Something? Yeah, I've heard It's a mind bender. Yeah, it's a good queue. mind bender. It's okay. something that's really, you know, it's like one of those forever type of movies mm-hmm. where you're like, oh, wow. You're, okay. you know, there are, a, let's just say, quite a few mysteries to try to solve while it's unfolding. Interesting. It's a... Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a clever use of, of one location, te- technically one location. Okay. Uh, but yeah, if you if you get a chance, check check that out. It's uh, I will. The camera the cameras are great. The acting is great. It's got a lot of what I love in when movies do is uh, like David Mamet does a lot of this where people talk over each other, like regular conversations. Right. <laughs> Sometimes like someone's finishing up a sentence and the other. The other person like starts their sentence like right as that, right at the denouement of the yeah. end of that sentence, and uh, so there's just a lot of that great stuff. So you'll hear like little, little nuggets of information like in the background. Like mm-hmm. even if it's looking at this guy while he's talking, you'll hear these people arguing back here, and you'll hear like jup, 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 three or four mm-hmm. little nuggets that come out back there, and it's like, yeah, it's a it's a really good one. I saw that last night, and okay. uh, the lobster. Did you see that? Yeah, I love that. Movie. Yeah. yeah, me I too. See his new movie. Which, what's his new uh, movie? The one that just came out, The Favorite, one with Rachel Weisz and... Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, the, the period piece. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's his movie. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And I've heard amazing things about that one. But the Lobster was awesome. Such a great concept. Yeah. Like, it was just... And it moved so smoothly, and so it just yeah. unfolded so well. Yeah, it's like a... It's almost like a, like a fantasy film. Yeah. Without being, like, a fantasy film. Yeah. But there's certain... There's definitely a lot of, like world building and rules that are applied it's cool yeah yeah I think the favorite is much more it's actually based on real people but the, the story itself is not necessarily true oh yeah yeah do you have any books that you're going to be writing writing yeah do, do you do you want to write any books or just mostly make movies yeah it's been a lot of it's been, a, it's been a long time since I've written anything in prose. I don't know that it, it, would, it would probably take a while to get into that mode again. I haven't really thought about that. I thought about maybe putting some things down as prose before I made it into screenplay, but then I just do the screenplay. <laughs> it's faster to operate quicker that way now because I'm so used to doing it. So, yeah. Not anytime soon. Any other little uh, uh, sentiments you like to add? Where, where can people find any of your stuff? Uh, I put most of the things that I have done, I just put up on my website. So just thedonnybrook.com. Thedonnybrook.com. Yeah. yeah. And that's it. I put everything there and on my Vimeo page, which all has links to it on my website and everything. So, yeah. Is that your alias? No, it was... It, <laughs> It was this uh, thing where, like, the, 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 it's a terminology from Old Irish, which means, like, a knuckle, an all-out bare-knuckle fight. 
and it was always funny because it sounds like, like you know, like a per, like a fancy production company like Overbrook, or yeah. whatever. But it's not. It's actually all like a beat down. <laughs> the Donny Brook. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you have any uh, Twitter accounts or anything? Uh, Instagram, any of that? Any of that yeah. razzmatazz? Uh, yeah, they're both the same. It's uh, the first four letters of my name, so Serge, S-E-R-G, and then my whole last name, Panero, for both Instagram and Twitter, Serge Panero. So, uh, can you spell that for everyone? So S-E-R-G-P-I-N-H-E-I-R-O. Just the same. That's it. Well, thank you for... Uh, I'm glad we were able to rap about all this, uh, all this stuff. And everybody, you've got to check out. Keep your eyes open. Keep your ears open. Keep all senses open for four, ever four number four E V R all capitalized. Um, keep keep your senses open for that one. When it arrives, uh, you're probably going to watch it quite a few times. Chances are you're going to watch it quite a few times. It's really. The colors are great. The acting is great. The story is awesome. The, it's uh, I don't know really what to say. It's it's like a it's, it's like science fiction. It's like a thriller. It's uh, slightly kind of could be regarded uh, hints of horror. I would say. Um, it's a fantasy, you know, this really might not help at all with your brain as to uh, going into it, but it's really cool. It's, there's so many, it, it covers all kinds of bases. So keep your eyes, keep your eyes peeled.